We have been teaching a series on uh, uh, intimacy with God. And, uh, oh, praise the Lord for those of you first time here at all night. <laughs> it is first time. And uh, Sydney is joining us tonight. They have their all night uh, um, once a month. And so, greetings to all, all of you in Sydney and anyone else of you joining us through this streaming. And uh, we have been touching on a series on intimacy with God. And um, today, we, we, we always do short little series. And today we do a little, uh, the closing of this little short series. And um, in uh, bringing for this message, sometimes it's very hard to find the right words to convey what we are trying to share uh, in the spirit. So if you don't mind, sometimes our human vocabulary is a bit short to express fully what uh, we want to bring forth from the Word of God. So in closing this series on intimacy with God, what we want to touch on, uh, as we talk about how to be intimate with God in this series, in all night series, and how much we want to be closer to God. And, and God too desires to be close to us. We know that God loves everyone whom He has created. God loves His whole creation. God loves us so much that He gave His only begotten Son to die on the cross for us. And so I will use the different words uh, because God cannot love us, love us all unequally. God has to love all of us equally for we are all His children. Uh, of course, we realize that not all of us love God equally. And God will love all of us and love Him with all our heart, mind, soul and strength. But in talking about intimacy with God, we want to talk about um, when God likes you. I know God loves all of us. And uh, so, I'm titling this message, When God Likes Us. Uh, God loves us, but you know that sometimes uh, He is upset at the people of God. At times when He has shown His anger. And I assume that when God is showing His anger during those times in the Bible, whether it be the Old Testament and the New Testament, when God is showing His anger, that His love is always there. His love is always underneath uh, His anger. For God cannot stop loving even though he's angry. And we know in human relationships, that can be so also. Uh, sometimes you, you, you love those who are, your loved ones, you're close to them, but they do things that they, they may upset you, and uh, they make you upset, they make you angry, make all kinds of things, but yet underneath, at the end of the thing, you still love them. And uh, so the same way, God's love cannot stop. And uh, it must not stop, because he is the God of love, and, and he is love. But God sometimes doesn't like us. He doesn't like the way uh, we do things. And I say, is there such a thing as God liking some people more than others? Now, remember, the vocabulary here, vocabulary, I'm running out of vocabulary. It might not be the appropriate words. Because some of you say, oh, how can God stop liking us? Well, I got no words to express this, but... Uh, the Bible did talk about pleasing God. And uh, so when God saw Jesus come out of the waters of baptism, and then God declares from heaven, this is my only, my only begotten son in whom I'm well pleased. Now what does God mean when he says he's well pleased? Does it mean that God say, I, li uh, I really like you? That's, that's another way, uh, very, very simple and childlike way to say it. Because if a little child were to ask you, what does it mean when God is well pleased with me? How will he answer the little child whose vocabulary is limited? He would say, well, uh, God likes, likes you very much. Is, and uh, what else is there? Uh, God is pleased with you. God is happy with you. Uh, you make God happy. Uh, God is smiling at you. And uh, we, know, we know that God smiles in the sense of, uh, we're talking about when His face shines upon us. Uh, incidentally, does God smile? Hey, if we smile, of course we are made in the image of God. I will assume that God smiles. If if God can get pleased, God can be well pleased, and God can uh, uh, be touched, and God can be angry, 
and uh, God can be upset, then I assume these are all variations of the different uh, uh, pleasure or displeasure of God. And so, some might think, well, God is smiling all the time. You mean that when He is uh, uh, pouring down judgment, when, when the whole world was being flooded, God was smiling and pouring down judgment? I don't think so. The Bible says in the book of, of Genesis 6, God was grieved. I'm sure if God was grieved and if we could have seen the face of God, you would see a grieving face in that sense. As God showed forth his grief. And uh, in fact, it will actually look cruel if someone is smiling and punishing at the same time. Let's say you have any parents you know, punish the children and they're laughing. And they're, <laughs> 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 Cannot, you can't. It just, the emotions are too inconsistent. And uh, so for that reason, we are trying to bring forward a concept that there is such a thing as God being more pleased with one, one individual than another. There is that concept. And uh, God loves everyone equally. But God can be more pleased. And that's why we talk about intimacy with God. Intimacy with God is learning how to please God. How to bring ourselves to the position when God looks down from heaven and God says, Hey, I like you very much. You see, does God do things like that? And say, Oh, He does that to Jesus. Well, do you remember He does that to Job too? He was so pleased with Job. Even though Job was not perfect. No one is perfect except Jesus. But yet there were some things in Job's life that pleases God. And in the book of Job, it tells us here, in Job chapter 1, that when, uh, this is the Old Testament, and the devil's authority hasn't been uh, judged yet. And he was functioning under the authority that he robbed Adam of. And so here, in verse 6, Job chapter 1 verse 6, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan also came among them. And the Lord said to Satan, From where do you come? So Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro on the earth and from walking back and forth on it. And then, having considered the whole earth, of all the planet earth, remember Job lived before the time of uh, Abraham. Some people think that he's Abraham's contemporaries, but from the way it's written, it's one of the oldest books in the Bible. It's apparently way before Abraham's time, during the time uh, when... Uh, uh, between Enoch uh, and after Noah, uh, between Noah and Abraham, sometime between that time. And it says here that God said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? In other words, God said, Hey, it, I like him. Have you, have you considered this person whom I like very much? And uh, uh, it says, There is none like him. I mean, when we sing the song, there is none like him. We sing it to God. I mean, think about God using the same expression on us and say, there is none like you. Wow. You sing to God, there is none like you. No one else, you know, can, can do what God does and love as God loves. And then God turns around and say, there is none like you too. Wow! Doesn't it warm your heart? When God turns around and says, Yes, He likes you very much. Well, He's saying to Satan, and He says, There is none like Job. In other words, when God compares Job to all the living human beings on the earth, God was saying, I like this man particularly. I like Job. And uh, He says, uh, There is none like him, God says. There is none like him on the earth. A blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil. I like him. In other words, God is saying, I like him. God loves everyone, but God says, I like him particularly. Because there's something in him that God likes. And uh, of course, Satan tried to say, oh well, Job, Job only served you because of this and because of that. In the end, he was proven wrong to a different extent. And also, we know the rest of the story of Job, that, that even though Job loved God and Job really tried to please God, Job was not perfect. But Job did try to please God. He was always asking the question, 
and he says, you know, I wonder whether my, my sons or children have displeased God. He was always thinking of God all the time. God was in his consciousness and God likes him. So, for a lack of a better word until we come up with another phrase, I could have kept to the Bible phrase, you know, and says, um, uh, when we please God, and then people look at the title, oh yeah, you know, pleasing God. But then, here we have the title, when God likes you, and that conveys it more to, to the point of what we're trying to say. When we get the attention of God, when God looks down and He says, I like what you're doing. And we become intimate with God. And we're talking about how to come to this place where God takes notice of you. When God says, you know, of course, there won't be another Old Testament story. So none of you need to worry. When God, you know, looks around and says, and announces to the enemy's world and says, Have you considered my servant? You know, so and so. And, uh, and then you find that, whoa, then Satan gets all his attention on you. <laughs> and, uh, you know, he says, Oh, I don't have attention. Oh, God, enough attention. You know, enough attention from you. But we don't have to worry about that because Jesus has defeated Satan. So that Job story will not be repeated. The principles are there, but Satan doesn't have the same authority today. And to Jesus, we overcome him. But there is this concept that we're trying to bring forth that we can reach a place where God likes us. He loves us, of course. He loves everyone. He likes us. Uh, we are different. He treats us different. Like in the Bible, we talk about in this series being a friend of God. And God considers you his friend as we talk about the book of Numbers when he dealt with Miriam and Aaron saying, look, Moses, I treat him differently because Moses had won the heart of God. And so as we close this series, we want to see what did these people do who, whom God liked, who pleases God? What did these people do that made God like them. What's so special about their life? Because if we want to be close with God, then we need to know how to touch God's heart. How to live our life in such a manner that God takes notice of us. God says, hey, I like that. I like what you're doing. I like what you are you're seeking to do. I like your heart. I like your attitude. I like this. We want to live our life in such a way, not only do we want to pursue God and seek God like the deer panted after the water brooks. We want to really seek God. But we also want to live our life in such a manner that we get the attention of God. Not just from our side, but from God's side. When we actually get the attention of God, we want that. And we've learned from some of the people in the Bible who got God's attention. Of course, some people are going to come in this series and say, well, in Jesus Christ, we're all equal. We're all saved by the blood of Jesus. we all got equal attention and all those other things. You know, of course, we all potentially have. We all potentially in Christ are equal. We're all priests and, and kings before the Lord. We all got the same access to the throne of God. We all have the same thing. But we all know the truth that not everyone is pleasing God. So how do we please God? How do we bring ourselves to that position? There are Old Testament and New Testament examples. So let's start in the Old Testament where in the book of Genesis, we know one of the people who call themselves friends of God is Abraham. And as we shared last week, that when, when you please God, God shares with you things that He doesn't share with other people. We know that when Jesus told His disciples in John 15, He says, You are now my friends. And uh, then He says, uh, A friend knows what... Uh, uh, the, the servant does not know sometimes what the master does. But now you're my friends and I tell you plainly. I speak to you plainly. So even in John 15 and in the New Testament, Jesus differentiates the progress of his disciples from being just uh, disciples to now being his friends. And Abraham called a friend of God in the book of Genesis, as he was developing a relationship with God, 
God also shares secrets. And uh, in John 15, we know Jesus to his disciples, I can now tell you things plainly that he couldn't tell before because you're not my friends. And uh, now, God considered Abraham his friend and God was about to do something in Sodom and Gomorrah to bring judgment. But this is what God said in the book of Genesis chapter 18. As he was coming by, Abraham and Abraham uh, invited uh, God to his place. And uh, in chapter 18 of Genesis, the Lord said in verse 17, And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I am doing? God didn't have to tell Abraham. God could just say goodbye to Abraham and continue on his way to do whatever he wanted to do. But the Lord says, Shall I hide from Abraham? Implying he will not. He chose to share with Abraham what he was about to do. And the reason why he treated Abraham differently. Now God was not going to tell the whole world what he was going to do. Neither did he go to tell anybody else. He just wanted to tell Abraham why he likes Abraham. Abraham was pleasing him. So he would share with Abraham some things that he would not share with others. And why did God like Abraham? And this is the other thing. It was 18. Since Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of earth shall be blessed in him. That is the promise that God, God gave him. We understand that. But look at verse 19, he says. God says, For I have known him in order that he may command his children and his household after him, that they keep the way of the Lord to do righteousness and justice, that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has spoken to him. Now, something about Abraham's life attracted God. Again, you see the same theme as found in Job chapter 1. It was that Abraham loved to do the things that are right. Abraham once loves to do the things that are just. He sought after righteousness and justice. Although there are none righteous except Jesus, all have seen and fallen short of the glory of God. But it was the pursuit of righteousness, the pursuit of justice. They might not attain it, for no man alive attain it, only Jesus Christ. But the heart's pursuit for righteousness and justice attracted God. If we want to please God, we must pursue after righteousness and justice. You always want to do the right thing. Never want to do the wrong thing, much even less an evil thing. You want to do what is right. The same with Job. God says, have you considered my servant Job? He says, Job, there is none like him. He shuns evil. He pursues righteousness. He wants to do the right thing. He wants to be upright. He's a man of integrity. And these things please the Lord. It touches God. It takes God's attention. And... Uh, God says, not only did he pursue it, Abraham will share it to his children. He will make sure that his children walk in the right way, keep the way of the Lord, to do righteousness, to do justice. So Abraham does it. Abraham is going to influence his children, teach his children, teach those around him. Do right. Do what is right in your heart. And uh, of course, right and wrong, there are general principles, right and wrong, there's a moral commandment, all these other commandments. But as we go closer and closer to what is wrong and what is right. Sometimes you reach a position where in the book of Judges, every man do what is right in his own eyes. And then there are conflicting things. And then you reach the New Testament in uh, Romans chapter 14, where some say that uh, they think that it is right to eat meat, some say it is right to eat only vegetables, some say it is right not to do this, some say it is right not. So this, when you go into nitty gritty, in the end, everyone wants to do what is right. But sometimes when you go to the non-essentials, outside of the other main commandments of God, what is right and wrong becomes a very situational ethics thing. <coughs> then how are we to judge? Like Paul says in John, uh, Romans chapter 14, he says, 
let everyone live according to their conscience. And Paul constantly say, he says, I have lived by my conscience. So right and wrong, these are the things that please God. The reason Paul pleased God is also, he says, he lived by his conscience. He wants to do what is right before God, always. In the book of Acts, as he shares his testimony, and uh, <clears throat> he tells us uh, in his testimony, uh, as he was confronted by the Jews in chapter 23, verse 1, Paul says, he looked over the Jews in the council and he says in verse 1, Men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. So he has tried to live by his conscience as much as he knew how. Now this desire to do right, this desire for righteousness, desire for justice, pleases God. And we know Abraham had a few times when he chose the right thing. He always chose right, even to his own harm sometimes, or hurt. Like for example, we know that uh, uh, before this incident in Genesis 18, uh, Abraham uh, had a situation with Lord where Lord and his uh, servants were quarreling. And this shows the generosity and the rightness of heart of Abraham in chapter 13 of Genesis. When he told Lord, he says in verse 8, Please let there be no strife between you and me, between my herdsman and your herdsman. See, Abraham was always seeking to do the right thing. And he told Lord, if you take the right, I will take the left. If you take the left, I will take the right. You choose. That's a very upright man. And he did exactly. Even though, even though Lord chose what outwardly looks the best, Abraham said, that's alright, I'll go the other side. He's an upright man. It's these small little things I got noticed. And... Uh, Subsequently, in the very next chapter, Lot got captured in a war. And Abraham had to come to his rescue. And uh, among them, also the king of Sodom was rescued since uh, Lot was living together with those people. And after Abraham in chapter 14 rescued them, the king of Sodom says, according to the custom of those days in verse 21, we're in Genesis 14, 21, Give me the persons, take the goods for yourself. Which was alright. In war, Abraham had conquered, it was his. So the king of Sodom says, I'll take the people, you keep all those goods. After all, you, you, you fought the war, you have won. A war is a costly affair. You have fought it by right of uh, warfare rules, it's yours. But Abraham said, and these are the things God is watching. Abraham says, I have raised my hand to the Lord. In others, he has taken an oath. We say, when did he took an oath? In his own private life, he got. See, Abraham has been doing little things. When did Abraham raise his hand and took an oath before God? We never see that happening. See, in his own way, he has learned intimacy with God. Remember one of those things I mentioned was making a covenant with God. And Abraham has sort of had a heart-to-heart talk and said, God, this is how I will conduct my life. This is how I will, I will love you. And uh, Abraham says, I have lifted up my hand before God. He has taken an oath before God. Most high the possessor of heaven, that he will take nothing, nor a tread, one tread, nor a sandal strap, and that I will not take anything that is yours, lest you have said, you say, I have made Abraham rich. Except only what the young men have eaten and the portion of the man who went with me. And so, the moment Abraham said that, in chapter 15, the next thing that occurred is, the Lord appeared to Abraham after the incident and said, Abraham, I am your shield and your exceeding great reward. So God saw it. God was watching. God is always an invisible, silent listening to every conversation, to every occurrence, to every event. Even when we don't feel the presence of God, God is watching us all the time. And when God sees a desire to please Him, it 
touches God in a way that God could say, I like that. I like that. And then God does something with us that He might not do with anybody else. We're talking about being intimate with God so that when God considers a whole group of millions and billions of people, you gain the attention of God. In line with that, there is an interesting story in the Bible, in the book of Numbers. The book of Numbers. And remember this is an Old Testament story. It looks a bit cruel, but it bears uh, illustration. Because it tells something about things that touch God in Numbers chapter 25. Numbers chapter 25 was not a very nice uh, surrounding or event at that time Israel has come out from Egypt and Balaam and, uh, and, and Baal had plotted to make the Israelite people be drawn away from God and make God uh, m- make God dislike them and they, su- they tried to get Balaam to curse them that didn't succeed in the end, uh, Balaam, through Balaam's suggestions too, they found a way which they could lure these people away uh, with the uh, sins of the flesh and the false gods that were there to lure them away from God so that they would displease God. So that, that uh, God would not be pleased with them, God would go and then they'll bring judgment on themselves. That's a very cunning uh, plot. And they succeed to a certain extent. And so here's the story, chapter 25. Verse 1 onwards. The, now Israel remained in Acacia Grove, and the people began to commit harlotry with the women of Moab. They invited the people to the sacrifices of their gods, and the people ate and bowed down to their gods. All this was plotted by uh, Baal and Balaam. And so they found a way. It almost looks like uh, how Hollywood and the devil is attracting people away and the things of the, of the world and trying to get people away from God. And sadly, in verse 3, Israel was joined to Baal. They went along with that, the Baal of Peor. And the anger of the Lord was aroused against Israel. So they displeased God. God didn't like that. And... Uh, The Lord said to Moses, Take all the leaders of the people, hang the offenders before the Lord out in the sun, that the fierce anger of the Lord may turn away from Israel. So they got some of the people who have worshipped false idols. Remember, they have already been uh, given the commandment, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. So they know. God says, You shall not bow to idols. Just because of these beautiful women, they went along and they bowed to the idols. And so, God was displeased. And it tells us here in verse 5, uh, Moses said to the judges, Every one of you kill his men who were joined to Baal or Peor. And in the, uh, everyone was really uh, sad. There was judgment happening. And it says there was crying, there's repentance, there's weeping. And in the midst of that, in verse 6, indeed, one of the children of Israel came presented to his brethren a Midianite woman in the sight of Moses, in the sight of all the congregation of the children of Israel, who were weeping at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. So while everyone was repenting and praying before God and asking God's forgiveness, and uh, the people who were there were judged, some of them were punished, they were killed, they were hung, and uh, all these people were praying and seeking God. And there is this guy... In the midst of the whole thing, when and bring one of these foreign women, walk by and with Moses. He said Moses saw it and everybody saw it right in front of Moses. Bring by the thing, you know, la 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 la. Go to his tent. While everybody was re- weeping and repenting, I tell you, that is terrible. Completely disrespect God. See, we know in the Bible many stories that show that there are things that make God angry, that cause disrespect to God, and God brought judgment and all that. We all know this negative side. 
But how come we are not taught there's a positive side? Surely, if one's actions and character can cause one to be distanced from God and end up with a judgment that comes, then the opposite must be true. Why only the negative? The positive is that one can live our life in such a way that you please God, then you actually become closer to God than anybody else. Even though God is no practice no favoritism, first favoritism is only there when everybody doesn't have the equal opportunity. If everyone has the equal opportunity, and some choose to take the opportunity to please God more and win God's favor and become liked by God and loved by God extremely, then you can't say that God is playing favorite. Because you can say, Hey God, why is that person so highly favored? And God says, You got the same choice. Then there's no more favorites. And so the principle that work that pushes away from God. There are principles that can bring us to an intimate level with God. When God looks from heaven, God says, I like you. And God says, you know, there is none on earth like you. Wow, that would be a wonderful thing, you know. We are singing, there is none in heaven like thee. Uh, of course, there is none in heaven, earth, and underneath earth, the whole universe like God. And then God says, there is none on earth like you. Wow. How nice for God to declare that. That should be our goal. So in the midst of all these things, there comes this guy walking by with this media like women and Moses might be cry, weeping and crying. Everybody's weeping and crying and the tears are in their eyes. They're weeping, repenting. Some could be beating their hearts out because some of the women, you know, their husbands uh, might, or, or, or their, their family or their children or their sons might be one killed and then they are all repenting before God cry. And, uh, and then with all these tears flowing to their eyes, there's this man who just walked by, you know, non calendly and just go to his tent. And that was too much. And there was one person, Phinehas, the son of Eliezer, the son of Aaron. This is the grandson of Aaron. When he saw that, Phinehas, the son of Eliezer, the son of Aaron, the priest saw it. He rose from the congregation. Remember this all Old Testament. Don't do it in the New Testament. He rose, took a javelin in his hand, and he went to this man's stand, and while they were there, with one javelin spear, he thrust it through them, and he killed all of them. And the plague, there was a plague that was going on, it stopped. It stopped. So not only was there sin, but there was a plague that was going on, people were suffering, people were dying, sickness came in their midst. And uh, all those who died in the plague in verse 9, 24,000 people. 24,000 people. Well, in our times today, uh, just uh, by now, about a uh, 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 nearly a month or so, uh, they say that in the Japanese disaster where there was an earthquake, tsunami, and this nuclear disaster, nearly... 28,000 people die. That's a whole world news. 24,000 people die. And that was just a small little group of people. That's a major thing. But whatever Finney has did, God was, it, it got God's attention. Now remember this is Old Testament and God did say the people who did that were to be punished with death. Now in the New Testament, there's no such thing. So this is still in the Old Testament. And going by the Old Testament principles, Phinehas, when he did that, God was touched. God was moved. Just as there's a group of people who sin, there is this, this Phinehas who really felt what God felt. See, to be intimate with a, another person, is you feel what they feel if they 
uh, the Bible says in the book of James, among uh, people in fellowship, it says that if is anyone sad, then you pray for them. Is it anyone che- uh, feeling joyful, then you rejoice with them. There's something to do with the fellowship. And in terms of intimacy, when, uh, when you are close with someone, when they are sad, you feel sad. When they're happy, you feel happy. Well, what about closeness with God? When God is upset, do you feel upset? When God is pleased, do you feel uh, the pleasure of God? When God is angry, do you feel the anger of God? And here Finney has, he felt what God felt. And by his action, he got the attention of God. And look at what God said. God invents new things for those who actually become intimate with him. You never heard of some of these promises that God just invented. Or, or, or it, was, it was over there. God got more, more things to give to us than we can dream of. And uh, in verse 11, God says, Phinehas, the son of Eliezer, the son of Aaron, the priest, has turned back my wrath from the children of Israel because he was zealous with my zeal among them. So that I did not consume the children of Israel in my zeal. Because what did God want? All God want was somebody to be like him. Finally, there was one, even one that God found. And God says, Therefore, say, Behold, I give to him my covenant of peace. He said, Hey, I never heard of that before. What is this covenant of peace? Yes, I also never heard of it before. I mean, you wonder, there's nobody else in the whole Bible that you got a covenant of peace. Say, what is the covenant of peace? Look, Eliezer, uh, 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 this is Phinehas, the son of Eliezer. He thought being a priest was good enough and he's a grandson of the high priest. And he said, what else can God give him? What else can God bless? Go invent something new and say, I will give him my covenant of peace. What in the world is that? That is just among those interesting things. Remember the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 2, I has not seen, nor ear heard, the things which God has in store for those who love Him. So there will be many other things that we haven't seen yet. Many other things that have I never entered the heart of man or the mind of man that we cannot imagine. God has seen His secret storehouse some special reward for those who love Him. See, there are those who love Him and there are those who don't love Him. God loves us all equally, but we don't all love God equally. But those who choose to love God more than others they have a reward. And by choosing to spend time with God, we pray that by coming to all night or coming to spend more time with God, you're doing it because you say, God, I want to please you. I want your presence. I want to learn to love you more. I want to show my desire for you. Because in the end, action speaks louder than words. We may say with our mouth, we love God, we love God, we love God. But you attend church three times a year. Easter, Christmas, and one on your wedding. So, oh no, they, oh, you know, how do you love me? Now, that doesn't mean that just because, you know, uh, attending church means you love God more. You could, you could, you know, uh, attend church three hundred sixty-five days a year, but you might not love God. You're just a full-time cleaner, and you're there not because you love God. You're there because it's your job. <laughs> so it might be different. God sees right into our heart. But when we say we love God, there must be ways that we show that we love Him. There will be, and. Finney has shown how much he loved God. And God says, I gave him my covenant of peace. And God discovered this covenant of light. He says, It shall be to him and his descendants after him a covenant of an everlasting priesthood because he was zealous for his God and made atonement for the children 
of Israel. I believe some sort of blessing came upon him. From that day onwards, all the angels know Finney has got a special mark in God. There's something that nobody else has because God, he did some things that please God and God likes him. God likes him. He learned how to bring himself to that position. Now, what does this story tell us? It, we are learning from the Bible how to be intimate with God. How to be in a place when God likes us. And there are principles behind and that we can learn from all these people. Uh, with the exception of the javelin and, of course, killing somebody else. There are other ways. In the New Testament, let's look at Jesus' uh, example. He says this in John chapter 8. Uh, we know the example when Jesus came out from the waters of baptism, when God, say, God declares that this is my son in whom I am well pleased. So we know Jesus was pleasing God. But here is a statement made by Jesus himself that he continually pleased God. In uh, John chapter 8, verse... 29, he says, And he who sent me is with me. The Father has not left me alone. For I always do those things that please him. See, Jesus was confident in the presence and the vindication of the Father at any point. Because Jesus says, the Father is always with me. Because I always, not just once, not just twice, I always do those things that please Him. So some of us think, oh, Jesus got it the easy way. I mean, He was just born, son of God, son of man. He just had to, he just had to do nothing and God was pleased with Him. No, Jesus also have to have to work out his life uh, as the son of man. And he has to do things that please God too. And he is not just our saviour, he's our example. He is also an example. An example not that we can follow him in our own strength. An example so that we can receive his strength and then do the way he does to please God. Not by our strength, but by strength that he provides for us. Because nothing happens automatically. Our free will is involved in pleasing God. Those who choose to love Him, those who choose to go the second mile with God, or the third mile, the fourth mile, it is our free choice. I mean, let's talk about, let's say, Singapore, small little country here, the red dot you call yourself. Okay, there are, how many people? Five, four million people. There are about five million people. It's a free choice for everyone in this country to seek God. No one prevents them. They could choose uh, any religion they want. There's freedom of religion. And if they choose uh, to follow Jesus, they are free to choose any church that they want to go to. It's a free choice. And they are free to look for places where people will spend more time with God or... or uh, it's a free choice. And I'm sure we, we might not be the only one who, who seek God with all night prayer. I'm sure there are people here and there who would seek God too. And those are also free choice. We all came here tonight by free choice. We choose to come. We could have done a few other things with the time that we have. We could. I mean, t time is precious, time is valuable. There are a lot of things we could do. Uh, a lot of natural things we could do to enjoy life. There are a lot of other programs that we might have in order to do some things uh, in our life or to, to uh, secure some things in our future. There are a lot of different things we could do, but yet we choose to be here. Free choice. And it's that free choice that Jesus also had. He needs to have choice and he chooses to always please God, to always spend time with God. 
and to always do those things that he know the father will look down and say this is my son there is none like him and we should have the same goal like Jesus has and so we learned that one of the major principles was to have a heart that beats with the heart of God and uh, involved in it is the pursuit of righteousness pursuit of justice the pursuit of those things that are in line with God's commandments what other things are there in the book of Romans chapter 8 Romans chapter 8 has a little sentence that says here in Romans chapter 8 in talking about the Holy Spirit being imparted to all believers Paul makes this statement in verse 8 so then those who are in the flesh cannot please God The flesh cannot please God. And if you include verse 7, it says, The carnal mind is enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So we know when we begin to uh, just consider natural things and just... Uh, uh, do natural things or the carnal things uh, the, the fleshly things we are not pleasing God and of course when we think about carnal things many, most of us think about okay that's just uh, the things that the Bible says not to do in all the sins of the flesh but there's a little bit more than that everything in the flesh everything in the flesh or anything to do in this life has no value eternally until you turn it into something that pleases God or that helps someone now I, li I leave the other point helping someone as a third point let me focus on that the first thing we talk about pleasing God is having his nature and having his heart his mind his commandments when you flow along with that it gets God's attention the second point that we're bringing across is you actually have to focus while we live in the natural world you must focus on spiritual things to please God now let me show some things that are not sin but yet it shows the difference between pleasing God in the second mile and, and not pleasing God or just being, a, being what I call a mediocre Christian a mediocre Christian you know as far as I'm concerned you know it doesn't matter although I know there's a call of God to reach to the millions and billions of people with the gospel with the word and all those things which we will do with the rest of our life whether it be planting churches or whether you're having healing crusades or all those things that, that will be done in the heart of heart I'm not interested in producing mediocre Christians If I have to choose between spending time with just 70 or 120 people who love God to the fifth mile, I would rather spend time with that than with the 20,000. Because we don't have enough life in this life or years to grow how we want to grow for the rest of eternity. In other words, I don't believe in wasting time. Every year of this life is important, whether we live at the 70, 80, 120, whatever. And so let me show something here in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 7. You must take in context, remember. I'm not talking about neglecting anyone. In 1 Corinthians 7, Paul makes this interesting statement and observation. Of course, Paul, is, Paul was single. Then when Paul comments on marriage life, you've got to take it with a pinch of salt also. And uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, 1 Corinthians chapter 7 Paul says here in verse 32 have you found it? 1 Corinthians 7 verse 32 so I want you to see in the Bible so you know it didn't come from me 
But I want you, Paul says, to be without care. He who is unmarried cares for the things of the Lord. How he may please the Lord. But he, of course, or she, who is married, cares about the things of the world, how he may please his wife. And then he turns around the other side. There is a difference between a wife and a virgin, the unmarried. The unmarried woman cares about the things of the Lord, that she may be holy both in body and spirit, but she who is married cares about the things of the world, how she may please her husband. Okay, for some of you, it's a bit too late. You're already married. <laughs> okay, you can't unmarry yourself. But, take it with a little pinch of salt here, that Paul was also writing because, from his perspective because he was single. Now, I know some scholars think that he was married because he was in the Sanhedrin Council. He could have been the Sanhedrin unless he was married. And all those what I call side circumstantial evidence. In everything, there's all exceptions among the Hebrews, among the rabbi. So Paul was brilliant. Uh, he says in the Bible he was single. So let's accept what he says and not you know, add to things. Paul was single and he was not married. He found that if he were to get married, that he would be spending part of the time pleasing for him, it would be his wife, part pleasing the Lord. Now, remember, it's the word please the Lord. In other words, you got less time with God. And that's a reality. Now, Please take it carefully. Don't take it as a complaint. Say, oh, Lama, now let's try to go. You know, so as if you, know, you, you don't love your loved one. You should love your loved one. Because there's other scriptures that say, if you love those who are around you, you know, how can you say you love God when you don't love those who are around you? So that, that's the third point. we we'll leave it at this time. But there is an aspect where the verse says, the Bible tells us that the that the flesh cannot please God. And we always take that verse to mean, okay, the flesh of the wrong things. But remember this, based on Paul's writing here, when he talks about difference between pleasing God and pleasing your spouse, the reason why, you know the reason why? He says, the things of this life. As we all know, marriage is only on this earth. When you go into heaven, there's no more marriage. So it's only on this earth. There, there are friendships, of course. There are teams. There are all those things. There are fellowship. But marriage is only on this earth. And the basis of what Paul was saying was the cares of this life. Now, the cares of this life, if you take the word cares of this life and do a research and study in the Bible, you will also find that the cares of this life are also what choked the word in the parable of the seed. That the third ground, where it was thrown among thorns, was the thorns represent the cares of this life. Now, the cares of this life doesn't refer necessarily to sinful things. Remember that. It does not refer to the things that are breaking the Ten Commandments. Because it, it would include, and flesh includes all those things. But the cares of this life just include in, in without breaking any Ten Commandments or any moral commandment, just giving all your attention to look for food, clothing, shelter, and pleasure is already the cares of this life. And Jesus said it again in the book of Matthew 6, where he didn't say it was something sinful or something wrong. But he says, these are the things that the Gentiles seek. These are exactly what the world is already doing. And by doing that, there's no differentiating between those who know God and those who don't know God. Now that we have known God, God has now become our, not just our Saviour, but our Lord. And that means, 
if you spend a lot of your time thinking, thinking, thinking about food, clothing, shelter, pleasure, you're not pleasing God. Because the flesh includes not just, remember, those who are in the flesh include those who are in the cares of this life. It includes, of course, the breaking of the Ten Commandments to go into licentiousness. But it includes just purely taking care of the earthly life which revolves around the physical body. Because your spirit doesn't need shelter. It's your physical body that needs shelter. Your spirit only eats the spiritual food. It's your body that needs spiritual food that you've got to earn money for. And your spirit has its own spirit clothing. It's the body that needs to go and buy clothing. Everything is the body. And just by giving a lot of attention to the things of this life, we are not pleasing God. Because you don't have enough time. Paul says, you have less time to please God. You have less time to please God. In his illustration, nothing wrong with that kind of relationship. There was nothing wrong. He was illustrating about you got, already got less time to please God. But of course, to those who are diligent, to those who are faithful, you know how to maximize your time. Because we also know that there are single people who spend all their time on food, clothing, shelter and pleasure. And they are also not pleasing God. So we know, and here's where I say, take Paul with a pinch of salt. He was single, so he doesn't know married life. He also doesn't know that in married life, you could, where one chase a thousand, two can chase ten thousand. That it both please God, hallelujah. Right. Whatever time that you already got half, then the other half plus the other half multiply, hallelujah. Praise God. So, when you learn about marriage, don't read too much about Paul. Read, uh, read that piece of Peter. He was married, he knew. And uh, so, I've got to balance the other side. Otherwise, after people hear this sermon, say, wow, you know, yeah. wow, wow. And then after, not enough weddings to conduct. <laughs> okay, we, we have, and so, we, and, but also that gives us an area to realize it is not to be married or to be single, it's, it's your ability and the gift that God gives unto you. But the reality is that, and the point that we are making here is that to please God, we are asking the question, how to please God. The first point is uh, be righteous and upright in your heart, in your mind, and in your action. That pleases God. And of course, you propagate that in your life. The second is be in the Spirit. Because Romans chapter 8, verse 8 says, the flesh cannot please God. So remember, when you are going out to the mall, looking for your next clothes and your next jeans or your replacement fashion that can match all your clothes, match your hair, match your belt, match this and match that. You're pleasing yourself not, and not pleasing God. And don't spiritualize it and say, I'm the temple of the Holy Spirit. If the temple of the Holy Spirit is cloth, God is pleased. <laughs> Please. You know? Because if that is so, then going all the way, like every day spend your, spend your time at the mall. So the mall, rename it, call it the temple of God. Because why? To service the temple of God. <laughs> right? So we spiritualize everything. No. Even Jesus himself said in Matthew 6, don't let these things, this worry of these things, bog you down. Because remember what it says in the Bible again, the cares of this life choke the word, prevents the word from coming. And if the word is not coming out from life, cannot grow, do you think it pleases God? Because it doesn't please God. And so, the second point on pleasing God, pursue spiritual things. Pursue the things that build your spirit. Now, we didn't say pursue it to the neglect of your spouse. Pursue it to the neglect where you come to church and you say, Hey, where are your clothes? Oh, I don't have time for clothes. <laughs> you know, you're dressed in a gunny sack. Right? At, least, at least dress properly. And you come to church 
You know, because you don't believe in clothes, you're so spiritual, you want to be like Elijah, you wear gunny sack. Where do you get that? Oh, somebody threw it somewhere. <laughs> so that's too extreme. Because, and, and we, we, we're talking about balance here. But overall, there is what I call a minimum time you do need to spend uh, with, uh, in terms of taking care of yourself, uh, in, of your health, and then taking care of your loved ones, your spouse, and your children. And those of you who are married, you haven't got children yet. If you can, if you are married, you you got less time with God. You need to spend time with your loved ones too. Uh, that also can be used positively, because then your loved one can say, "Hey, the Bible says you must please me too." <laughs> okay. Anyway, so and uh, so that you need to spend time to develop the relationship. But when your children come, you got even less time. You get another whole lot of mouth to feed and to cloth and to also take care. And in, the, in being caught up with this, we must be careful not to displease God by neglecting the spiritual. Because the moment your whole life revolves around the flesh and the things of this life, you are no more pleasing God. When God looks down, you're no different from the Gentiles, from all the people of the world. Because what do the people of the world pursue? These are the things they pursue. Food, clothing, shelter, pleasure. That's all they want. they want. They want power, they want money, they want pleasure. That's all. And the Bible didn't say that those things should not be a part and parcel of our life. Matthew 6, Jesus said, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And then all these things are added unto you. So He did not neglect us. He did not say that those things are wrong. He just says, don't give too much worry or attention to them. Because when we do, we are robbing ourselves of the opportunity on this earth to please God. So there are those that can please God. The flesh cannot please God. Only the spirit can please God. Uh, involved in the spirit pleasing God is... Hebrews chapter 11, which most of you know that verse, in verse 6. We're talking about when God likes you. How to put yourself in a position when God likes you. Now you begin to know some of the little secrets. You know, what some people spend, what some people spend five hours in a mall to get something, you know, you might... Uh, you, or by all means, you can go to the mall and pray four hours there <laughs> and spend one hour shopping. No, nothing wrong with the place. But uh, while pe some people find five hours just trying to, trying to sort out you know, simple things like clothing, uh, you might spend one hour and then the four hours you save, you spend with God praying in the Spirit, uh, doing whatever you want and ch chasing other spiritual things. These are the little differences you do. When God looks down from heaven, He says, there is none like you on the earth. See, this is different and it pleases God. It gets God's attention. Hebrews chapter 11 tells us here, in Hebrews 11 verse uh, 6, it says, Without faith, it is impossible to please Him. For he who comes to God must believe that He is and that He is the rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. Now, I like to include that under seeking spiritual things. It says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. Now, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. In other words, you exercise faith and come. What kind of faith is involved? It tells us that when you come, you believe He exists. And because He exists, you want to spend time with Him as, as you want to spend time with any natural person. Although He's invisible, you know He exists. And although He is available everywhere, God's presence here and everywhere in the world is the same because He's an invisible God who is omnipresent. But we are not omnipresent. So we separate ourselves. We, we pull ourselves away from the things that we do. Pull ourselves away from things that distract us in order to find a place where we can say, Here we are, Lord, seeking You. Those who diligently seek Him, that means you don't just seek Him once in a blue moon. And neither are you one of those who are desperado Christian. You know the desperado Christian? They only seek God when they're desperate. 
when he's desperate, you know, say, oh, you know, critical, you know, either they got some sickness, no cure, oh, now time to seek God. Or they are in poverty, no one, one can help them, no bank can help them, no, no friend can help them, no one, they know this is, this is the end, then they say, oh, time to seek God. Your name is not Desperado. Desperado people belong next to a group of people called the Bandito. So who are the bandito? Those who break God's commandment. And bandits. So you're not desperado, you're not bandito. Praise God. I was going to say you're esperado. But I don't know what that means. So, but you are those who are spiritual, who seek after God, not just one, but seek God diligently. Day in, day out, you're seeking God. Day in, day out, you're seeking God. And then when God looks down, God is pleased. There are a few New Testament people, or rather just before New Testament came, they are like that. You hear about Anna, the prophetess. She seek God in prayers continually. You hear about Simeon. And Simeon seek God continually. He believe in God. And guess what? Both of them were rewarded. They were rewarded because they were so consistent. At least God gave them a chance to see the Messiah in a flesh, though he was just a baby. Right at that time, God's Spirit led them to the place and time to see the Messiah, which many before them could not even touch. They could hold, they could touch the Messiah. So God knows how to reward. God does exceptional things for those who please Him. And so this included in seeking God and how do we please God when you're in the spirit the flesh cannot please God and so Jesus says I do those things that please him in John chapter 8 and we have read just now he says he continued he always do those things because Jesus was always pursuing in the spirit you think you know how much time would Jesus spend in a coffee shop how much time would Jesus spend in the mall or shops that he had? After Jesus might have gone shopping. How much time did Jesus spend? All the time his attention was always on God and spiritually. He was inclined. Now, we realize the natural needs its own attention. It's just like if you own a car, we expect that you know how to bring the car for service, keep your car in, in a proper, proper uh, thing and maintain it properly so that it can keep, uh, transport you. The same, you own a house, you've got to upkeep it properly, you're not going to turn it into a pig's sty. Uh, and uh, so the same way with your physical body, there's a little bit of tension that you need. You know? We don't expect that you know, suddenly we're all spirit beings. And so then you don't bathe, you don't comb your hair, you don't brush your teeth, you don't cut your hair, you don't clean yourself, you don't put on you know, and tidy yourself. So every time when we speak to one another, the bad breath is also shared. You know, and all the, the every one of us look uncam and horrible. You know, so we all end up you know, looking like a, a bunch of bums from the slum. <laughs> that wouldn't please God. There is a minimum time to mender, but you know, the whole world spends maximum time on that, and almost zero and minimum time in the spiritual thing. So that's lopsided. To please God in the things of this life, spend whatever sufficient time that is there. Now, of course, there is no average. You know, some people say, oh, there is an average time, you spend more than that, you're overspent. You know, depend. You know, some, some people just need more time than others in those things. But generally, most of our time should be spent on spiritual things. Without neglecting your spouse, without neglecting your family, without neglecting the stewardship or the responsibility let's say if you have a job or you have some natural responsibility we're not neglecting all those things and you spend maximum time that you can in the spiritual things of God then you can please God lastly in the book of Acts is a story of a man in Acts chapter 10 that got the attention of God and he was not even a believer. In Acts chapter 10, 
There was a man called Cornelius. And he was a Gentile and he was a centurion, a Roman soldier. In Acts chapter 10 was one, a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of what was called the Italian regiment, a devout man and one who feared God with his household. So I will assume he was one of the upright righteous men too, since he feared God. And the word fear God must mean that he was a man of integrity. And then he says, who gave alms generously to people and prayed to God always. Now he was not even a believer. And why did he give alms? Because he was caring for the poor, he was caring for others. Which again we say is that the third area here that our lives are also measured upon how much care we give to people and the care for others around us. Whether our life is a selfish life or a life that is caring for others, that makes a difference in us pleasing God. It says here, about the ninth hour, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God coming in and saying to him, Cornelius! When he observed him, he was afraid. Say, what is it, Lord? And the angel said to him, Your prayers and your arms, two things, your prayers and your arms have come for as up for a memorial before God. Memorial. It was something that got God's attention. A memorial is like uh, something like you build to remember some things or to, to be evidence or, or, or to cause you to, to give thanks in some area. And his was a spiritual memorial that heaven saw. His alms giving and his continual seeking of God and this is the other part of him always seeking God. He got God's attention. God sent an angel to him even though he was not a Christian yet. He was not born again yet. But he definitely was a spiritual man. And he definitely was one who, who didn't just spend his time on secular things. Not many centurions are like that. A lot of centurions will be gambling, drinking, or bullying people. This centurion was helping people was seeking a God whom he has not known yet. And he was reaching out in arms. His arms that were there. Doing good. Caring for the poor. Caring for the needy. Well, that moved God. Now you notice something in the Bible that all through the Bible, whether Old Testament and New Testament, when God gives His commandments, He always gives a little loophole to care for the widows and the orphans. Because these are the people, most of the time in society, they are helpless. The widows and the orphans and the poor are remembered before God. So sometimes God gives interesting commandments where He tells them that uh, when they harvest the harvest, and if they collect the, the harvest and some of it fall to the ground, He says, don't pick it up. Why? So that the poor people can come and have it. God always have that heart for the poor. Because in the book of Proverbs, when you look at the concordance of the poor, you find that there's a verse that says that he that lended to the poor lended to the Lord. So apparently, when you care for others and you live your life not just for yourself, but as God bless you, you bless others. As you as you are promoted, you promote others. You begin to pull everyone upwards with you. <laughs> That seems to get the attention of God. Now, why do you think God bless Abraham? God bless Abraham so that he can be a blessing to all the families of the earth. Genesis chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. And Abraham was one of those who was already seeking to bless others. You can tell he took care of Lord. You can tell the way he took care of his servants and the way he does things. And when he saw God, he straight away slaughtered his best things in order to worship God. 
because he was someone who always not just look after himself he looked after others of course he looked after his loved ones and others God bless him even more so that through him all the families of the earth can continue to be blessed the blessings are never just for us Paul has a scripture in the book of Corinthians that tells us that when one has an abundance and one has a lack, the one that has an abundance is for the reason to supply for the lack. He says so they all will have equality. And this life is made in such a way when God gives us a greater capacity, whether we have greater capacity in talent, in giftings, or greater capacity in uh, power or in finances, the greater capacity is so that we can do a greater good. Not so that we will build uh, idols and altars onto ourselves and become and take the place of God. That will be wrong. Third thing that God looks for is how we can become as generous as our God, our Father. Can you imagine if God becomes stingy? Of course, it will never happen. You know, it would be terrible. Anyone who disputes God should die. Why? Don't let him breathe my oxygen. <laughs> and whoever, you know, does all the things, disputes, God just, you know, puts a uh, put earthquake, separate all that, zoom, poop, go into the sea. So everyone who lives are the only one who please God. No, God is so generous that He sends rain on the just and on the unjust. Because God loves everyone. And all God seeks is more people to be like Him in generosity, more, more people to care for others. And that is why God loves it. When you could rise to the place where you become to love your neighbor. And of course, if you ask a question, who is my neighbor? Then, Jesus answered with a good Samaritan story. You know, the good Samaritan story was told in answer to the question, who is my neighbor? Why the Pharisees were saying, trying to be smart, and say, Jesus said, love God, love your neighbor. Then he said, who is my neighbor? Samaritan, I don't like him. And of all things, Jesus tell a parable of the Samaritan, whom they don't like. And, you know the story of the man robbed along the way? And then Jesus even illustrated. The first guy who came by to the poor man who is wounded, robbed by robbers, was a priest. And then the man, the priest saw the wounded man crying, you know. I know he's wounded, so I assume he would be, uh, he would be groaning. Oh, oh. Oh, you know, along the road, injured. Because he'll be groaning. And the priest, as he sees him along the road, the Bible tells us in the Good Samaritan story, he was walking along the same side. He crossed the other side. He actually crossed the other side. And then continued walking like he didn't see. That's not a neighbor. Then comes this uh, Levite, who is supposed to know God too does the same thing and then finally come the most unexpected the Samaritan and he Samaritans and Jews are like uh, Israelites and the Palestinians they don't get along well and when the Samaritan saw the Egypt man he doesn't care whether he was a Jew or a Samaritan Bible says he went there to his aid Wash him, dress his wounds, brought him to a hotel, paid a hotel bill for him, took care of him. Why? He was the man in need along your path. It's very noble of many people sometimes. They want to help some missionary thing far, far away. And then they neglect the people nearest them, their own neighbor. God, Jesus himself rebuked uh, the Pharisees for doing things like that. You know, it is not noble to have some missionary far, far away and then at home, your wife no food to eat. 
children, not enough clothes. The clothes that they have is for when they were three years old. Now they're 14. <laughs> but, you know, you're helping everyone. So you're neglecting the actual people around you and you're helping some noble cause somewhere. Of course, God wants you, if possible, to help both. But sometimes it's easier to say that we love those far away whom you don't really know than to lo love those whom you actually have come to know. Both their, what I call, uh, faults and their good points. It's important for us to know what our neighbour is. A neighbour is anyone living across your path, in your life, your immediate circumstances. Your neighbour is not far away. Your neighbour is those around you who have needs around. Like the Bible always tells us, how can we say we worship God, worship God, we praise God, and then, you know, let's say we become a rich church and you worship God, and then, and then there could be someone who don't have food to eat. Say, how can it be? No, one must take care if you know. Of course, we don't know everyone everywhere. We don't do a survey coming in uh, as they come to the church. Hey, you got food to eat. Go food to eat. No, 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 you don't do a survey. As you know. And of course, there's always, uh, Jesus says, the poor you always will have. There will always be those in need. So there's no end to helping the poor, I can guarantee you. You can sell all that you have and give to the poor, there'll still be more poor people. No end. So there's a balance area of help in this area. But while we balance, it's important to remember. It's still important to help. It's still important to be sensitive to people's needs. And God is looking at all those things. I wonder... You know, we read the Bible in Acts 10. Wow, Cornelius was a good man. It's good to see him like that. But you know, when I read, I ask myself this question. When did he first start doing this? When did he first start giving his first alms? Right, he has to start somewhere. When did he start praying? He might learn it when he was small from someone. He might pick it up as a good thing that he learned from somewhere. Or, he might have experienced a situation where he identified or empathized with another person's need. And from helping one person, he started helping more and more. And that grew until it became a continual help that he was always giving. And God is pleased with that. God is pleased with that. We talk about when God likes us, how to be intimate with God. And we could summarize these three points in this way in terms of spirit, soul, and body. You seek the things of the spirit as a priority. Your soul becomes like the soul of God that loves righteousness, that loves uprightness. And your body, you put it in a proper place and you help those around you. And I close with that scripture in First John. Gospel first, uh, in the episode of 1 John. And it says here about God in verse chapter 2 verse 15 do not love the world or the things in the world if anyone loves the world the love of the Father is not in him for all that is in the world the last of the flesh the last of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father but is of the world in the three things mentioned. These are the things that make the difference. Because, you know, every one of us are in the world. Every one of us, if you are here and you're born again, you come to know God. Every one of us have 24 hours. Every one of us might have different amounts of talent, different amount of finances, different amount of ability. But every one of us must find a place where if we really want to please God, 
then your relationship with the world has to change and your relationship with the things of this world have to change your relationship to yourself the pride of life have to change and pride comes in many forms selfishness is pride they just turn in a different way sometimes the best cure for selfishness is to actually help another person agape love as we saw last week what is agape love sacrificial love where you know some people think that you have to be rich to help another person you don't have to and sometimes people think that you have to be very rich to be generous you don't have to you could be generous because you don't spend much on yourself you could be generous because uh, you have uh, what I call uh, a limit as to how much you really want to spend for yourself like for example you know uh, just because you got a thousand dollars doesn't mean that you have to spend uh, money on a $900 meal and left $100 to give as tied to God no whether you got $1,000 or you got $100 you might still spend the same amount of food and of course you might be able to spend slightly better quality food maybe even on some supplements and vitamins which sometimes are expensive but it reach a point even though there is a difference where there's a maximum spending beyond that becomes a luxury like we all would recognize probably if a person spend you know uh, about five dollars ten dollars on on a meal that's that's about average you know or if your budget is tight then you spend and you budget to one two dollars you know maybe eat four eggs or plenty of protein for the day whatever you know how to budget you know how to spend according to your need cut your coat according to your cloth but even if you have lots of money you know still the average is five to ten of course once in a while you treat yourself you go for a buffet you know that might cost more thirty something dollars or so you know but but how much more so let's say you increase it doesn't mean when you increase oh now you're gonna spend on one of those meals remember those meals one little fish in Singapore where you hear one little fish they order the bill came to three thousand dollars well what kind of fish is that you <laughs> know and uh, I don't think just because it costs three thousand dollars it does him more good than the two dollar fish right in terms of protein molecules it might be actually less who knows it might contain some radioactivity whatever <laughs> in some dry place but we all know this that in the end it's how we balance our life in such a manner that whether we are more or less being you don't need to be super rich to be generous you just need to have a very generous heart so that I can tell you if there's a poor person around and if I got only enough money for my food and he's really starving there and I bought one ton noodle for three dollars and fifty cents I would divide my one ton noodle half half you eat half I eat half at least we both still live <laughs> rather than eat the whole one ton noodle and then you die in front of me <laughs> you don't have to be super rich to be able to do something generous and it is these little things that God look for it is these little things and quality that we can learn intimacy with God and we can learn the wonderful privilege when we get the attention of God and what we say in this is when God likes you and one of the things when God likes you you actually reach a place where it's very difficult for God to unlike you. You reach a point where you you actually given, as I mentioned in this series, you're given more room to make mistakes than other people. Of course, in some things, mistakes you cannot do. Like Moses, you know, he beat the rock twice. God said, ah, cannot enter promised land. And he keep talking to God, talking to God. God said, stop talking to me about that. But then, in spite of everything he did, when he died, God sent angel to resurrect him early. While Abraham, you remember Abraham's bosom was still in Hades. God resurrected Moses ahead of time. 
We know in the book of Jude, he sent an angel to resurrect Moses. So guess what? In heaven, when Moses went there, there were not many human beings. The other human being, Enoch. Then there's Moses. He said, and Enoch meets Moses. And Moses said, where are the rest? Oh, the rest are down there. Still waiting for Jesus Christ to come. Why? Because Moses had pleased God. He had gone the extra little mark and so God treats him slightly differently. When he defended him against Miriam and, uh, uh, and Aaron, God says, Moses is not like other prophets. So God does give the extra little uh, leeway because once God likes you and you never go away from Him, he likes you eternally. You're close to Him. And you could be in a place where Jesus was, where He says, He is the only begotten Son in the bosom of the Father. This is a challenge that we throw to you at the end of this series. Intimacy with God. It is our choice to be intimate with God. It is our choice to pursue God. And why do we teach this series? Because there are not enough Enoch's. There are not enough Moses. There are not enough Elijah's. There are not enough people who pursue God to reach that place. Too many Christians are satisfied with salvation as it is. But they are not pursuing God to go the second mile, third mile, fourth mile. And we pray that in these last days and even more before Jesus Christ, you know how the end time revival will be? You think it will be brought about by a bunch of uh, half-baked Christians who half love God? No. The end time revival will be brought about by a group of Christians who love God so much that their love for God becomes like a flame that sets all the other Christians ablaze. And thus, in the first great awakening, a small group of Christians, John Wesley, Charles Wesley, George Bifield, and a few others, they were not out just to change the world. They just wanted to love God more. And they seek God so much even while they were in some sort of college or training that people call them the holy club. What we are talking about is this holy club. History records that out from that holy club, a small group of people change their world. John Wesley, Charles Wesley, George Whitfield became used by God, and there were many others, these were the prominent ones, to change the entire countries of North America and Europe of those times. It was called in Christian history the First Great Awakening. And even in secular history, it writes how because of the religious revival, the whole of Victorian morality was raised up a notch. It was actually falling down. It impacted nations in those days and all of Europe and all of America. The revival is always carried on the shoulders of the few who go the extra mile. And God is calling you and I to be among good and good the holy club to be among those who God consider in the intimacy with God club it's your choice and my choice I pray God may raise you from all over the world God raise some of you those of you here into that to pursue God let's pray Father we pray that you will raise up more and more people to be intimate with you and Father, we know, Lord, at this moment, they are just a few. But sometimes we do not know, Lord, like Elijah, who thinks he's the only one, and then you say, hey, there's 7,000 more. 
Who knows, Lord, there could be a hundred thousand all over the world of people who are super hungry for you. People who will give up everything, including their life, to pursue you with all their heart, all their mind, all their soul, all their strength. Our Father, we know that in the revival that you're bringing forth, it will be on the shoulders of those who have found intimacy with you. And we pray, God, that even as we seek your face week after week, and we take this time to seek your face, that we will find that place where you can say, there is none like them on the earth. There's none like these of those who love you, who pursue you, who seek after you with all their heart. Father, we want to be among those people. As long as we have breath, as long as we have life, we will breathe every breath for you. We will live every drop of this life for you to pursue you not half-heartedly father we are tired of mediocre christianity we are tired of half-hearted christianity we are tired of playing church we are tired oh god of a christianity that is worldly with one foot in the world and one foot claiming to be in the spiritual dimension when there's only one toe we want a Christianity that is full of your spirit, full of your word, and pursuing you with the fullness of our heart. And we know, Father, it doesn't come easy. Love never comes easy. When we choose to love, there's always a cost to that love. When we love our loved ones on earth, there is a cost to that love. When we choose to love you with first love, there is a cost to this first love, Lord. And we are willing to pay the cost. To be able to stand in all eternity and say, we have loved you with all our heart, mind, soul and strength while we were on the planet Earth. Father, we want to be among those that love you. So, Father, choose from among us, Lord, and raise up from among us, from this body and the body of Christ all over, those who love you and pursue you with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. And then, Father, show to each one of us the things that has not entered the heart of man, nor ear heard, nor eye seen, the things which you have prepared, for those who love you. We thank you, Father. And we know you will reveal that from time to time, from week to week. We thank you, Father, that you will show us those things that you are reserved for those who love you so that we can partake with you and walk with you. In Jesus' name, amen.